It's a real pleasure to be here today among so many minds still asking vital questions about climate. I have a new idea for you that I don't think many of you have heard before, and it's very important. Now, I climbed my first active volcano when I was 19. I spent my honeymoon studying earthquakes and volcanoes in Alaska. I received a PhD from Columbia University studying earthquakes and volcanoes in Iceland. I was 27 years with the United States Geological Survey, put many instruments on new active volcanoes. I uh, also managed the earthquake hazard reduction program. So I had a long and distinguished career in volcanoes and earthquakes and other hazards. And I retired, and I was having a really good time traveling the world and uh, skiing and mountain climbing and doing all those kind of things. And one day I stumbled on some data that just didn't make sense. It was a real enigma. And this ended up consuming my life. After looking into the details a bit, which I'll explain in a minute, I ended up putting everything else aside except for my wife and trying to understand what the relationship is between volcanoes and climate. And it turns out to be very important. So what I'm gonna show is that climate change throughout Earth history warm suddenly and cool slowly in erratic sequences that are not cyclic. A valid theory of climate change must explain these erratic sequences. Starting in 1988, about three dozen scientists started drilling holes in the summit of Greenland down through the ice. And out of these ice cores, they could measure many things. Perhaps the most important was by measuring the oxygen isotopes in the air bubbles, they could get a proxy for temperature at the time that ice was formed. Another thing they measured was sulfate. And sulfate comes from several sources, but the biggest source is volcanoes. And so by measuring the amount of sulfate, you get a measure of volcanic activity. And what they found was, Shown here, the black line is the proxy for temperature. The red line is volcanic sulfate per century. And you can see very clearly at the end of the last ice age, this is 25,000 years before present, back about 12,000 years ago, there was major warming when we popped out of the ice age. And you notice that there was major volcanism that was continuous for about 2,000 years. And that turns out to be very important. It's the duration of the kind of volcanism I'm going to talk in a minute that leads to warming. There's ample evidence where this volcanism was at that time. It was in Iceland. This is the mountain called Herdebreithi in uh, northeastern Iceland. And it's called uh, Atuya, or Table Mountain. The name means broad shoulders. And what made these broad shoulders was that when you have a basaltic lava eruption under ice, the basalt can't flow away like you see it do in Hawaii. It, has to, it gets chilled, so it has to build upward. So this is a mountain of basalt, of the kind of thing you're used to seeing in Hawaii, but it's built up vertically. And when you look at a whole bunch of these, <coughs> Uh, in Iceland, are these different two years on the lower right. You can see that uh, most of them that we see today were quite active between about 14,000 years ago and 12,000 years ago. So we can go into Iceland and put our fingers on the rocks that were being formed at the time we warmed out of the last ice age. Now what I didn't really enlarge upon when I was showing that was that the enigma that I saw in that was that every volcanologist and every climatologist knows volcanoes cool. It's absolutely understood, and you ask any climatologist today, they'll tell you we know that better than anything else. And so I said, wait a minute. How could volcanoes both cool and warm? And this is pretty clear evidence that there was warming, that caused warming. So the kind of volcanism we're talking about that was going on under the ice is what we saw happen at Barthabunga in central Iceland in 2014. This is just lava flowing out on the ground. You can stand fairly nearby and watch, just as you can in Hawaii. But this volcano oozed basaltic lava over an area of 85 square kilometers. That's 20% of the size of London in six months. In Hawaii, it takes at least 17 years to erupt that amount of lava. 
This was the highest rate of basalt extrusion since 1783, the eruption of Laki. That was 233 years ago. So this was an exceptional event, and most of you probably never heard of it, because it didn't interrupt airspace, because it didn't explode. It appears to be, have caused the very rapid warming that we've observed since this volcano erupted. And I can give a whole talk on that, but I'm not going to today. But that's why I argue 2016 is the hottest year on record. We went through the, the global warming hiatus, where there was no real change in temperature from 1998 to 2013. But in 2014, as Bader Bunga erupted, we've had a rate of increase of temperature that is almost 30 times as fast as the increase in temperature from 1970 to 1998. So other historic major effusive volcanic eruptions include Laki on the left in 1783. This is what it looks like today. There's my wife wandering in the, in the basalt flows. And that erupted about 565 square kilometers. And then there was Eldia in 935, and it erupted 800 square kilometers in somewhere between three and eight years. And there was these eruptions back in 935 AD that led to the onset of the medieval warm period. Now, if we look at the extinctions going back over 300 million years, we see that the greatest extinction was during the time of Siberian basalts, or the Siberian traps as they're called, in uh, Siberia when basaltic magma oozed over the land covering an area of seven million square kilometers. As a result of this, 96% of marine species died, 70% of terrestrial vertebrates died. This was the biggest extinction in history. It is clearly related to uh, the basalts, it was the change from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic. It was a huge climate change. There was ocean acidification. There was uh, actually ozone depletion, we think, from the, some of the fossils. Uh, it was a major event. When the Atlantic Ocean started opening up, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province covered an area, again, of basalt, 11 million square kilometers. Major event. And then 66 million years ago, the time the dinosaurs and the, uh, got into trouble, the Deccan basalts in India covered an area of 500,000 square kilometers. So the kind of event I'm talking about at Bar the Bunga is just a really small part of what we've seen in history. And what we've seen in history is minuscule compared to what we see in geologic history. And associated with all these events was major warming. So major effusive volcanic eruptions extrude basaltic lava over large areas. They do not explode much debris in the stratosphere, so they don't interrupt airplane flights. They last for months to hundreds of thousands of years. They deplete ozone, causing major global warming. And I won't have a lot of time to talk about that today, but that is part of the mechanism that's going on. And we can see the ozone depletion. And they acidify the oceans, causing major mass extinctions. The acidification we're talking about here is sulfuric acid, which is a lot more potent than carbonic acid. We don't drink sulfuric acid. <laughs> so they cause minor to extreme climate change. Now I want to talk about a totally different kind of volcanism, but this is the one you're most familiar with. This is the explosive kind of volcanism. And this is Mount Pinatubo that we showed a picture in 1991. These volcanoes explode over a very short time, a number of hours. There might be several explosions over several days, but that's it. They last, they may recur every 500 or 1,000 years. Some do, some don't. But the eruption is just a spurt, and it's a major spurt. They form aerosols up in the stratosphere. The sulfur dioxide goes up and forms a sulfuric acid aerosol. The, the particles grow big enough to reflect and scatter sunlight. And so they lead to a net global cooling. And the effect of this cooling is pretty significant. It's about a half a degree centigrade for two to three years. The really big ones might be three or four years. But this modeling in the lower part of my slide, the upper part of that model shows 
modeling what the ocean temperature was, assuming the cooling that went on associated with Krakatoa. And what you can see is that for 100 years, we're still seeing the effect of the cooling of just a few years following the eruption. This modeling on the right is another way of looking at this, where you're modeling the amount of expansion of the ocean or contraction of the ocean as the temperature changes. We're talking about millimeters that you're not going to measure, but, but this is just as you heat water, it expands. And so if you cool water, it contracts. And you can see the effect of Krakatoa uh, on the uh, lower right uh, figure. And then uh, you can see that we began to recover, but then Agon came along in 1963, El Chichon in 1982, and then Pinatubo in 1991. So this sequence of explosive volcanoes increment the world cooler and cooler. And when this kind of a sequence of five or 10 big explosive volcanoes per century exists for millennia, that's how we get into an ice age. We cool the world down incrementally, very slowly. Now, following the Pinatubo eruption, there was a major depletion of ozone. This graph, the, the data points are the annual average ozone at Erosa, Switzerland. And the reason I chose that station is it was the first one that's still recording from 1927 to now. And what you can see very simply from this is that Pinatubo led to the greatest ozone depletion ever observed. And then what's really peculiar is AF Yadlyukl in 2010, the one that interrupted European airspace, it was 100 times smaller than Pinatubo, but it led to similar ozone depletion. So we have lots of evidence that both explosive and effusive volcanoes actually deplete ozone, which changes the amount of solar energy that can reach the Earth. And that's a whole other story, which I won't go into today. So the effect after Pinatubo was as much as three and a half degrees centigrade warming in December and January following the eruption. But after that, then the aerosols took over. They were covering the whole world, and we got net cooling from explosive eruptions. So what we have is a balance between the duration of effusive volcanism, the Barthabunga kind of volcanism, and the frequency of explosive volcanism. If you've got high frequency explosive, you cool the world. If you've got long duration effusive basaltic, you warm the world. And what's amazing is we see in the record this balance going back and forth at amazingly high frequency. This is 120,000 years before present to the present. And basically, it's the oxygen isotope proxy for temperature on the left, with cooler being down. And what we see is that we're down in the ice age. And then there's sudden warming coming out of the ice age. And then we go back into cooling again. And over a period of millennia, uh, we can cool back down into a colder ice age again. But when I look at the actual data records, look layer by layer, I find that the warming in many cases occurred within a few years, usually less than a decade. Now this is one ice core, but there are many ice cores in Greenland and elsewhere, and you see the same kind of thing. You see this very rapid warming followed by slower cooling. There are 25 times in the last 120,000 years when this can be clearly seen in the data. These were known as Dansgaard Esker um, warmings. And so the average is about 5,000 years. But you can see it's not cyclic, it's very erratic. So there's sudden major warming within a few years, followed by cumulative cooling over centuries to millennia where the warming and cooling occurs on average every 5,000 years, but the timing and the amount of warming are erratic. They are not in cycles. This has to be explained, most, it is most clearly explained by this balance between effusive volcanics causing warming and explosive volcanics causing cooling. So I want to talk about cycles a minute. The green line here is, again, this oxygen isotope proxy, and it's taken from deep sea cores. Uh, benthic sites, uh, 57 of them around the world, some of the best ones out there, and they averaged all the data together and they smoothed it a little bit. 
And you get this very clear picture that back here uh, in the last interglacial, the Eemian interglacial, we went down into the ice age. We kind of stayed fairly one temperature for a while. We went down some more. And ultimately down here between 15 and 20,000 years ago, we got to the bottom of the ice age. And then we got what I showed you in my first slide, the sudden warming coming out of the last ice age. And this is the Holocene here and where we are. Looks like a pretty reasonable way of going. And if we, I should say also the, the vertical black lines are known major explosive volcanoes that I tabulated in one of my papers. Now, I've added the black line, which is the Milankovitch cycles, the effect of insulate change in solar radiation reaching the Earth from Milankovitch cycles. And with a few beers or a couple of bottles of wine, we can make a lot of science out of this. You can see there's a fair similarity between what's going on here, but it doesn't all fit that well. But if we look at the real data of what's actually happening on the upper left, what we see is that the lower part of the, the coldest part of the ice age was not down there uh, at 10, 15 to 20 million years. This just doesn't want to work. But it was way back at 70,000 years ago. Um, and again, it's sharp warming, slow cooling. Sharp warming, slow cooling. Global warming happens suddenly and irregularly. So the closest thing to truth in science is good data. This is good data. It's clearly observed. The nice thing about oxygen isotopes is you measure a sample. And in a drill core, you can date that sample pretty darn precisely. Erratic sequences of rapid warming followed by slower cooling. So to use uh, Nils's uh, uh, polite words, the new dawn of truth I propose is recognizing that a valid theory of climate change must explain these erratic sequences. They're there. We see them very clearly. So to go to somebody you worship, uh, Al Gore, he said, scientists have an independent obligation to respect and present the truth as they see it. Well, Al, the truth as I see it is that climate change throughout Earth history warms suddenly and cools slowly in erratic sequences that are not cyclic. And I haven't got the slightest explanation for how CO2 could cause that. A valid theory of climate change must explain these erratic sequences. Thank you very much.